Alrighty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liam. I'm one of Dan's old master's students. Um, some of you may have read in the introductions channel that I finished my thesis with Dan at the end of 2021. And then I've been a hiking guide for the last year or so in the Tasmanian wilderness. And then uh, these two over here pulled me out and here I am in Berkeley talking about phase transitions in toy ReLU networks. So, <laughs> um, so uh, this talk is largely derived from my thesis that I did a few years ago and also a sequence of posts that I've been writing on Less Wrong, which is called Distilling SLT, which I'm sure most of you have seen in the Discord channel. Um, across the last few days. So without further ado, we are going to be talking about phase transitions in toy ReLU networks, and we will be studying which singularities are preferred by the posterior and when this changes in these very simple toy ReLU networks. So the goal of the talk is going to be to understand this phase transition. Every time I see it, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Took a lot of effort to get it. And uh, yeah, it's pretty pleasing to see. But of course, right now, you have no idea what this is showing, but at least you can get some sense for like, hmm, something a bit funky is happening in that posterior. So that's the content of the talk. What is going on in that posterior? So I'm going to start with a recap of some of the key ideas from the last few days and add a few pretty animations on top of that to illustrate some of those key points. And then I'm going to uh, analyze the different phases in a particular toy model setup. And then we will study two different phase transitions that happen in the true distribution um, as a result. So by the end of the talk, um, the, we'll probably get to those phase transitions. And hopefully, if I've done my job right, it'll be obvious what is going on just by all the setup with the theory of the free energy formula and whatnot. All righty. So our basic setup, we have a model truth prior triple on a parameter space W and the model is given by some function f of x w could be linear regression in this case it's going to be a neural network function plus some Gaussian noise this is the standard setup in SLT the empirical negative log likelihood because of our regression setup um, it is just the mean squared error of what the neural network predicts compared to what the um, true uh, true y value is. So I should say here that uh, we are in the what's it called the supervised setting where we have data um, from some uh, some distribution on the input, and then we're trying to predict the output. And so the negative log likelihood in this situation is just the mean squared error. And so one of our fundamental objects of study is the posterior, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by this point. Um, the ZN there, just as a reminder, it is the partition function and that just normalizes the posterior distribution to turn it into a probability distribution. Just. Sorry. Just. Just. <laughs> well, depends on your frame of reference. <laughs> In some sense, it's just some constant. In another sense, it's the holy grail of everything. So, um, and then we have the KL divergence, which you can think of as the loss. Um, in particular, when the truth is realizable by the model. So that is to say that our model class is sufficiently deep that it can perfectly model the true distribution. There exists some parameter w0 such that um, such that f of xw is equal to 
oh, sorry, such that the true network is equal to the model evaluated at that parameter, then the KL divergence is just the Euclidean distance between the two of them um, with an added term that is the input prior. So just as a reminder, they are our basic objects that we will be studying. Think of the KL divergence in this talk as the lost landscape, I suppose, because we will be dealing with a realizable case. All righty, so the free energy. Given some local neighborhood in parameter space, the free energy of that local neighborhood is defined as negative log of the integral of the posterior over that particular region in space. So as, um, as has been discussed so far, the free energy is a fundamental object of study because it measures posterior concentration. And so, oh, I don't know what happened there. Cool. Um, and so, a low free energy value for some particular neighborhood means that there is high posterior concentration there, which means that the posterior is telling us that there are good models in that region. And so, we can use this formula to compare different models across parameter space. Watanabe's free energy formula, also known as the widely applicable Bayesian information criterion, says that as the number of samples from the true distribution tends to infinity, the free energy is a trade-off between in Dan's language, he's been calling it an energy entropy or an energy complexity trade-off. I'll be calling it an accuracy complexity trade-off in this talk. And to go through these terms once again, n is the number of samples from the truth. Ln of w is just the mean squared error evaluated at the most singular point in the set. I'll come to what the most singular point is in a moment. Lambda W is the local RLCT of that particular neighborhood. And this W0 that is the most singular point in the neighborhood, well, it is an optimal parameter within the interior of the neighborhood. So it can't be on the edge. And it has the lowest RLCT of any point within that neighborhood. And so the most singular point is uh, it really defines the geometry of the neighborhood curly W. So. But the L LNW0 is not So, but, but the LNW0 is still just the mean squared error. That's actually quite, you, you sort of apply a regular, the, the regular answer there. Yes. Is that right? Okay. So the, um, the ln of W0 is yeah. the mean squared error evaluated at the most singular point plus a constant that is kind of irrelevant from the point. Oh, of I the see, model I see. But, but, but you kind of use a, like a um, Gaussian, the Gaussian answer there, Gaussian approximation answer. Uh, I mean, the what, mean squared error is the KL divergence for, for Gaussians, no. Not quite sure. Am I saying so? The Gaussian and the output around the output value. Okay. It's, that's, that's not like regular. That's on the, uh, that's on the well, my understand what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is like, I, my understanding is that in singular models, like you shouldn't assume things are Gaussian. Okay. So can, can people hear Dan? So singularity or regularity is about the posterior, whether it is well approximated by a okay. Gaussian or not. But he's the Gauss the Gaussianity uh, yeah. here is in the the model, which conditional on the input in, to the network is Gaussian with respect to the output. But it's Gaussianness in the predictions about the output. It's not Gaussianness in the posterior. Uh, that okay. that Gaussianness oh. there 
is oh. what gives us mean oh. squared error. Sorry, I missed that. that all good. Sense. All good, all good. Good question. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> cool. So that's Watanabe's free energy formula. We're going to keep this up throughout the talk as a bit of a holy grail so that we can just bludgeon <laughs> you to death with, with this free energy formula. Um, okay. So we can sort of depict this model comparison picture by considering two different neighborhoods of parameter space and depicting two different most singular points within them. And so, of course, what we see here in this cartoon is that the most singular point of red W is just that point there, W1. And then the most singular point of green W is W2. And um, just as a reminder, W opt is the set of minimizers of the KL divergence or the um, or L of W, the expected uh, negative log likelihood. So we sort of have two cases that we could be dealing with in this um, toy setup here, I suppose. Suppose that both of these parameters do lie on the set of optimal parameters, but as our cartoon suggests, one of them has a different RLCT. It is a more singular point. So in this cartoon, this point here is going to be more singular and therefore it will have a lower RLCT than that of green W. And therefore the free energy formula tells us that red W will have a lower free energy and therefore it is preferred by the posterior and uh, well, yeah, therefore it's preferred by the posterior. Um, in the second case, oh, actually I will say here that this is a great example of how this formula gives us some kind of realization of Occam's razor because it's saying, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all good. Um, yeah, so you can sort of think of this as an Occam's razor type argument because it's saying that if two models are similarly accurate, then the one with the lower RLCT will have a lower free energy and therefore be preferred. And so in that sense, the simpler model is better. In case two, suppose that the more singular point had a worse inaccuracy or a worse accuracy, I always get those terms mixed, um, but it still had a lower complexity, then the free energy formula is telling us that as n tends to infinity, oh, sorry, let me say it the other way. At finite n, the more singular but less accurate point can have lower free energy, but ultimately, because this term here is the dominant one as n goes to infinity, it's the leading order term of the free energy, the, more, the most accurate parameter will always be preferred of the two. So let us... Mm -hmm. uh, two questions from the audience. One is um, you can replace the Gaussian noise term with any uh, noise model and the rest will go through as the same. Hmm. Uh, but the rest, I think, the rest of your presentation. <laughs> um, like, yes, the replacing the noise would change the, the um, yeah. yeah, what ln of w is. Mm. Uh, let me think. I'm pretty sure the rest of the talk would go through the same. Which is uh, really weird. Well, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't really. Like you get exponential noise, you get something like with noise with some other exponent. And... Yeah. Oh, no. I don't know. I. Probably not critical. Science. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to say. My guess would be that under like sufficient niceness conditions, the rest of it would kind yeah. of carry out. 
more or less the same. The graph would change, but the theory, the the, the point of yeah. the presentation would yeah. change. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the the free energy formula certainly wouldn't change. That's um, what the negative log likelihood is is irrelevant to the free energy. Well, sorry. The theorem holds whatever the negative log likelihood is with the correct conditions on that. Yeah. Um, other question? Second question. How do you measure the singularity in algebraic geometric terms? Rank of some module? Uh, me I, think, <laughs> I think he's talking about the measure, the most complex singularity. Um, the lowest RLCT. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Uh, is the interpretation of RLCT as complexity a consequence of the free energy formula? We will talk about that in the next S L T high then say. Yeah, yeah, should have been day one. What is this R L C T thing that we keep hearing about? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. So to illustrate these ideas a bit, let's take a callback Lieber divergence as follows with two true parameters that both minimize k of w and we can intuitively see that the region around this singularity is flatter and that is what the rlct is measuring so they both have the same inaccuracy and just to remind you that Oh, always does this. Sorry. Just to remind you that K of W is equal to L of W minus S, where S is the entropy of the true distribution, which does not depend on W. So as it tends to infinity, it is just some constant. So they both have the same inaccuracy. They both minimizes global minima of K of W, but they have different RLCTs. They have different complexity terms. And in this particular case, the KL divergence is nice enough that you can just calculate them. You can basically just read them off. And it's just in the neighborhood of negative one, the squared term is dominant. And so the RLCT is the reciprocal of that. And in the neighborhood, of positive one, the RLCT is just a quarter. And so we can consider two different neighborhoods around those points, and we can analyze the free energy about them. So we could consider a neighborhood around negative one and a neighborhood around positive one. So our free energy formulas look like this, which means that because of course a quarter is less than a half, W1 will be preferred as N tends to infinity is what the free energy formula is telling us, which means that W1 will have lower free energy, which we can see with this very simple little animation. So what we have here is effectively the posterior in some toy sense and what we are seeing is that the free energy about the purple region with the lower RLCT, that is a lower free energy than the yellow region. And Watanabe's formula precisely predicts this. So the lower RLCT singularity has greater posterior concentration, has lower free energy. So true parameters are preferred according to the RLCT. Let's look at a slightly modified example where the formula is a little bit annoying and a bit weird, but basically all that has happened is that we have just raised this singularity slightly above zero, which means it is no longer a global minima of the KL divergence, but it is still a singularity. It is a local minima. So we have the same singularities but this time different inaccuracy. And we're keeping the complexities from before and the same neighborhoods. And so this time 
we have these free energy formulas. And so what this is suggesting to us is that as n tends to infinity, the more accurate parameter will be preferred. But at finite n, we could be in a case where there is um, where the simpler model is preferred despite being slightly less accurate. So in this picture here, we've just got C as being 0 0.1. <laughs> So let's see a depiction of whether this marries up with what actually happens. So as we increase N, the free energy of the simpler model is less at small N, but then very satisfyingly, it reaches this point right here where they are equal and then they are monotonic after that. And so the more accurate parameter will always have lower free energy after that particular critical value of N right there. Let's just watch that once more. So non-true parameters can be preferred at finite N, but ultimately the most, uh, or ultimately true parameters or the most optimal parameters with the lowest accuracy will always be preferred as n tends to infinity compared to those that are not optimally accurate. Inaccuracy. Lowest inaccuracy, sorry, yes. It's always frustrating talking about that. Yeah, but like, yeah, but you're all coming from <laughs> physics, not statistics. <laughs> um, so free energy, right? like, yeah yeah well you can't call it the free accuracy that doesn't make sense <laughs> um uh we so we're starting to hint at a first order phase transition here and i'll come back to that in a moment so to carry on from jesse's talk uh, or jesse's talks in the last few days a phase is some region of parameter space that minimizes the free energy and remains a minima with small perturbations in some hyperparameter. And so this is the kind of picture to have in mind with that small perturbation thing is that even if the free energy of the minima changes, so on this curve here, we've got free energy as a function of um, some different regions here. I'm not going to go into too much depth about how to interpret that, but think of these minima as corresponding to different regions as measured by some function. Um, the uh, well, I can't name infinite. <laughs> oh, I was just saying the the v equals two thing there, just denoting a w two. That's all right. It's not a minimum that you're... No, no, it's not a minimum, sorry. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yes, as we vary some hyperparameter theta, then they remain minima of the free energy. So, if a phase is a region that minimizes the free energy, then in our context, what that means is that it is a region that contains some singularity of interest, some singularity that has low inaccuracy and low complexity relative to other points, perhaps. And so we can return to our little cartoon here. And we can say that these two neighborhoods are different phases that contain different singularities. And so from this point of view, it doesn't really matter how big your neighborhood is as such, as long as it is focusing on that particular singularity of interest, because it is that singularity that defines the geometry and gives a different accuracy complexity trade-off across parameter space. 
So to link this back to the actual definition of what the free energy is before the formula, a phase is just a region that contains some non-negligible posterior concentration, at least in some variation of the posterior across all of hyperparameter space or something. Because a phase is kind of, you can kind of define it to be anything, but it only becomes interesting when it has a low free energy and it has some singularity structure that is interesting to it. And so in our images from before, the two phases are the two neighborhoods that we defined about the two singularities of interest, just those yellow and purple regions there. So that then brings us to what is a phase transition in this context? Well, from the physics point of view, a phase transition is a change in the configuration of the minima of the free energy. And so we can have a first order phase transition where there is an exchange between local and global minima as we vary some hyperparameter theta. And so you can see here that at uh, theta less than theta C, the red phase is the global minima and then above the critical value, the blue phase becomes the global minima. So that would be a first order phase transition. We can have a second order phase transition where there is a merging of two minima. And then we can have a different kind of second order phase transition where, is, where a minima is created or destroyed at some particular um, critical theta value. And so since the, um, since the equilibrium state of the system, the state of the system that has the greatest posterior concentration, um, since that is the global minima of the free energy, that state will have some jump or the free energy will have some jump in it, some discontinuity, some non-analyticity at these different phase transition points. So from our point of view then, since the free energy measures posterior concentration, a phase transition in the statistical learning context can be thought of as a drastic change in the posterior at some critical hyperparameter. And so to return to our little image from the start, this we're going to explain is an example of a first order phase transition. And you can just intuitively see there that there is some drastic change that is happening to that posterior. And then we also have an example of a second order phase transition. I'm also going to explain this at the end where these minima over here are somehow destroyed as we vary some hyperparameter in the true network. So a phase transition is a drastic change in the posterior from the point of view of statistical learning. With that in mind, there are a few different ways that you can induce a phase transition. You can shove some hyperparameter into different parts of the posterior here. You could call the hyperparameter simply the number of samples from your true data set. I think Dan was talking about this in your talk yesterday, varying n and how that induces phase transitions. You can vary the true distribution, uh, which is what we're going to do in our toy setup a bit later which just means that the data set depends on theta, which means that the negative log likelihood depends on theta and therefore the KL divergence depends on theta. You could put a hyperparameter into the prior or you could also put it into the model, I suppose. Note here though, because we are in the Bayesian setting, i.e. in SGD steps. Not yet, anyway. Obviously, this is what 
Testing, testing, testing. Yes, I can hear you. Oh. Oh, good. Yeah. How much did the audience miss? Is this slide familiar? This one is. Cool. So maybe I'll just repeat what I was saying at the end. In our Bayesian setting here, um, we cannot speak of a phase transition in time, i.e. in SGD steps. Not yet, we can't. Um, we're hopefully going to build that bridge in, <laughs> or someone's going to build that bridge at some point so that we can take the insights of singular learning theory into the modern deep learning setting. Um, but it is important to acknowledge that that isn't there yet and that the phase transitions have to be understood in terms of the variations in these objects that I've put up on here. Alrighty, so just to cap off this section on phase transitions, as I was alluding to before, we have already seen a first order phase transition. And the way to interpret that this is a first order phase transition is that the global minima of the free energy changes at this critical value here from being the purple curve oops, to being the yellow region. And so in that sense, that's how you can understand it as being some discontinuity of the free energy because the preferred state jumps from being one phase to the other. And as we explained when I first put this up, that was because of the accuracy complexity trade off. We can also look at a second order phase transition where two minima merge. And here I am inducing a phase transition by changing the, well, I suppose the true distribution that changes the KL divergence. And we see that these two minima that, or these two singularities that start with RLCTs of a half and a quarter, when the, um, as we vary this, oh, well, theta, I should say, as we vary theta and we bring it to the origin, the KL divergence here is just W to the six, which means that the RLCT of the origin at the end of that uh, merging is a sixth. And so in that sense, we've merged two different singularities to create something that is more singular. Um, with that said, there is a slight nuance here um, that I won't speak about too much, but as we've said, we can think of a phase as being a region that contains a particular singularity of interest. As the two regions start to sort of collide with one another, they do start to lose their distinctness as phases. Yes, Alex. I have a very basic question and mm -hmm. possibly it's just a sign flip, but I'm confused about something. It seems like the RLCT is smaller if it exponent of w is higher mm -hmm. um but i also have heard this intuition that the rlct is some sort of measure of simplicity mm. it my basic like idea is that high higher exponents are more complex than lower exponents mm. and is that just not that just other slipped? Way around. it's yeah. the other way around yeah. so the way to think about it, I suppose, is that this W to the six yeah. will be a flatter yeah. curve. And therefore, in the words of information theory, it will require less bits to describe the same level of information, energy. Given a precision. Do you want to give the microphone to Dan? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so in the W to the six, because it's flatter, finally, <laughs> because it's flatter, um, if you want to specify a parameter with loss less than epsilon, you've got more wiggle room. You can make, you can be less precise about the parameter values. You can use less decimal places. So in that sense, it requires less information to specify such a parameter. Yeah. I'm not sure. So, so sorry, I fix an epsilon and I compare W to the fourth and W to the sixth. So what do I have to specify now that is easily specified for W to the sixth? So taking K less than epsilon slices, so you've got some horizontal line. Yeah. Now think about all the parameters which satisfy W to the six is less than epsilon. There are more of them, right? Uh, that's a wider right. basin. So therefore you need less bits to specify a parameter there. Right, so it's it, it just, if uh, I look around uh, the yes. singularity, I take an epsilon ball, that ball is literally bigger in volume. And therefore a very simple, more volume means it's actually less, I need less, bits to specify it on a global level. Okay, thanks. No, no worries. Jesse just alerted me to the fact that I did that picture a little bit wrong. Um, in the first post of the less wrong sequence, there is, um, for a shameless plug, uh, <laughs> there is a, a depiction of this, um, of this little diagram down here and how to think about the difference in the scaling exponents. Okay, so, We've now sort of understood what a phase and phase transition in statistical learning might look like. So what are the phases in neural networks? Well, that is going to be the next part of the talk. So our toy models that we're going to consider here are two layer feed forward ReLU neural networks with two inputs and one output. I will also refer to a few basic examples of just one input um, ReLU networks throughout, so don't get too confused by that. But the phase transitions we'll see are in these precise models uh, with D hidden nodes, D up there. And as a reminder for some of you that may not be from AI land, the ReLU function is just that. And what that means is that these functions are uh, piecewise hyperplanes. So as a nice simple example, say we had D equals four hidden nodes defining this particular network. The, I should say, here the WI are the weights of the first layer. The BI are the biases of the first layer. The QI here is the weight of the second layer and the C is the bias of the second layer. And so, and so this WI with X, um, that's just the standard dot product. So in this little example down here, we've got four weights, easy weights to deal with. We've got a nice little neural network graph and the resulting function as I say, is just a piecewise hyperplane. So some terminology to help understand this particular function. We say that a node in the network is degenerate if either the incoming weight or the outgoing weight is zero. That means that that node has no contribution to the overall network up to a bias, which is not really worth dealing with. Um, we say that a particular node I is activated in some linear domain if the input to the ReLU up here is positive. Because of course, since ReLU only gives a non-zero output for a positive input, it's going to be active if that input is positive. And so the way to think about that is that we have these nodes down here, like this one, W to the four, W four, that is saying that this node is active 
everywhere in this region down here. And so in that sense, we have these activation boundaries associated to each node, which are just these lines where they, um, uh, these lines where the nodes become active. And so a nice little intuition here is that you can think of the weight vector as being anchored on its activation boundary, and then it points into its region of activation like that. Cool. So we're going to have a setup where we have a model with D hidden nodes, a true network that is realizable by the model with M hidden nodes, or general model class, I suppose. And we're going to assume that we are in the realizable case where the truth can be modeled by the uh, model. Sorry, where the truth is realizable by the model. And so because, because the KL divergence is zero, if and only if Q, the truth is equal to the model at some W, if you carry that out, what that means is that there is some W0 for which the true network is defined by the model there. And so what that is saying is that the set of true parameters under our regression model is precisely the set where there is functional equivalence of the network. So if you define a fixed true network, the set of true parameters is the set of parameters that you can put into the model here that gives you the exact same output, gives you the same true distribution. And so the task of finding the singularities, finding the points on W0, finding the phases becomes the task of finding the symmetries of these neural networks that produce functional equivalence. What we're going to see is that there are a few generic symmetries that are true for all points. They are scaling symmetry, permutation symmetry. I'm going to explain these in a sec. And then there are two non-generic symmetries in this setup in the sense that they only occur under very particular conditions on the true network. They are orientation reversing symmetry and particular degeneracy of nodes. So let's run through what these look like. Do you have a question? So, um, okay, we're in the realizable case. There's another way to talk about this that we're in the over-parameterized regime. Like, when, when we have a... Not it's... necessarily. So the first three of these symmetries, um, what I sort of prove in my thesis is that the first three of these hold in the case where the true number of nodes is equal to the model number of nodes. So M equals D. And then the, the particular degeneracy one, that is sort of the over-parameterized regime. And um, that only occurs when uh, yeah, the number of active nodes in the truth is less than that of the model. Cool. All right, so the first one, scaling symmetry. There is a scale invariance in the ReLU function, which means that for any positive alpha, you can just shove it inside the ReLU and then reciprocal of it outside the ReLU. Oops and it will produce the same function. So what this means is that say we defined a true network with these WI0, BI0, et cetera, then any model network parameterized by this alpha value, alpha I, if you put it into the weight and you put it into the bias, as long as you reciprocate it on the outside with the QI, then it will produce the exact same network. 
And so in that sense, the scaling symmetry is the easiest way to understand these models as being singular. It's not the most interesting, but if we have a look at this little example here, just to build some intuition about what makes these singular, we have this nice little easy setup, very easy calculation shows that the KL divergence is given by that function there, which is depicted like that. And so the sense in which this is generic is that this scaling symmetry occurs across every level set of this function. You can always scale it by an alpha like this and it will produce the same network. What was the curve? Can you go back? So here, the set of true parameters is the set W, Q is equal to a fifth. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and it's curved because we just, we're assuming Gaussian noise. So no, no, it's just that that is, that's just W, Q minus a quarter. Just, yeah, I see it. Yep. Yes. Question, Stan. <laughs> um, would it be right to say that by somewhat reparameterizing your network by thinking somewhat different relatives, you could get rid of the symmetry? Yes, you could. But the key thing here is that we have a very, very simple model where of course you can do that and you lose no expressiveness from the model. But this scaling symmetry of an inner and outer node and inner and the inner weights and the outer weights of a particular layer of the network, it holds for all layers of any of these feed forward ReLU networks. And so you couldn't reparameterize that because it's um, the best way to say that. Like to reparameterize that would be to remove like all the layers, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, good way of explaining it, I suppose. So, in other words, that is simply an artifact of this particular toy model. It's this degeneracy holds in all feed forward ReLU networks of any arbitrary depth and width. But it's broken. It's broken as soon as you introduce regularization, right? I and if, yeah, and if yeah. two layers have different aspect ratios, the aspect ratios is an interesting one. Right, because like if, sure. they're, if they're the same width, if they're the same number of neurons, you might still be able to do do this kind of scaling, because then the one over no, I think no, I don't think so. I don't think it matters about the architecture of the okay. network from memory. The regular regularization would do something to it, or in in sort of my language here, I would say that that's maybe changing the prior, and therefore that would affect, um, yeah, affect the the scaling symmetry. But it's a, it's a smooth change to the geometry. It's not. It doesn't change the, the singular structure. By. Uh, if by reparameterization you and you don't it's not a reparameterization you're eliminating one degree of freedom by like replacing the parameter by like basically getting rid of a cube if you like mm -hmm. uh, so that's like slicing this thing in which case you will get rid of this particular singularity but mm -hmm. that's right i mean you can't you can't independently remove that at all the nodes because the scalings interact across the whole thing mm -hmm. yeah As a Mm -hmm. There's a comment from uh, Matt. So I, I think it's a comment on the, your your non-standard use of the word over over parameterization. Um, uh, so he said that I think you might call it over over parameterization when nodes of the truth is less than the nodes in the network. But in practice, we um, over over parameterization means um, zero training loss on the data. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And he says something about in which case there may be more symmetries because we are, you are talking about in uh, something akin to an infinite data limit. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah. I guess you want to comment on that? Um, there's probably not too much to comment other than to say that, yes, to be careful with the terminology <laughs> and that, um, yeah, to say that uh, we're in the over-parameterized regime here is really just to say that the model has more nodes than it would need to model the truth. And yeah, not worth getting too much deeper than that. That's just the word that we were using there. Okay, so that's the scaling symmetry. The permutation symmetry is very basic. It just says that the labeling of the nodes doesn't matter. And so if your model is equal to the truth, then there exists some permutation of the underlying truth nodes in the model, which is just another way of saying the colors there don't matter. Which node is pointing into which direction doesn't actually matter. So that's easy peasy. Now, this one is not easy peasy. This is weird. <laughs> the orientation reversing symmetry. If there are true weights that annihilate one another, which is to say they sum to zero, we'll put that up in a sec, then these weights can be reversed. They can be flipped. They can be negated. So the easiest base case to look at here is the following simple truth where we have W1 is equal to one and W2 is equal to negative one. Yeah. Those weights there. Then we can define a model which flips those weights and adjusts the bias and has the same activation boundaries and produces the exact same function which you can see by looking at that little schematic there. The reason that we can do this is because these true, uh, these true weights sum to zero. If they didn't sum to zero, then this symmetry would not exist. So if there is some set of true nodes such that they annihilate one another, then you can reverse the weights and produce the same function which you can see with this little schematic here. So because those three weights cancel out, if you sum them together, then you can flip them and it will produce the same thing. And lastly, degenerate nodes. If the true network has less nodes in it than the model does, and we're supposing that all the true nodes are active here, then each excess node is either going to be degenerate, so it has no contribution, or it could be non-degenerate, but because the activation boundaries of these functions are like the pivotal piece of data, if you've only got four activation boundaries, if you've got six nodes to model those, you can only have nodes that share all of those particular four activation boundaries. So your node can be non-degenerate, but it has to share the same activation boundary as one already in the model, already in the truth. And it has to satisfy some sort of um, gradient summing accounting business. So this is very easy to see with this particular setup here. If we have a one node, true network and we have two nodes in the model, then we either have one degenerate node and uh, yeah, sorry, one node being degenerate and one non-degenerate or vice versa because of the permutation symmetry. Or we could have both nodes being non-degenerate, non -degenerate, but they have to sum to one. And so that's just the same. Both of these setups uh, um, produce the same function. And, and is that to be positive? Uh, in this, yeah. uh, yes, yes, they do have to be positive because it would be pointing away from the origin if it was a negative weight in this particular setup. And so it would give a contribution where the true node had to be zero. Yeah. 
tree network had to be zero. So yeah, in this particular one it does have to be positive. The reason that we've delineated these is that they correspond to different phases. And you can see with this little diagram here, just a little bit of intuition for why this might be. So any point along the line W1 plus W2 is equal to one, not at the endpoints, any point on that non-degenerate line has the same geometry, but the degenerate points, sorry, the nodes, the points on K of W that correspond to node degeneracy. Leo, what you're talking about, so you have in mind a two node network with the same activation boundary and the weights adding up to a fixed constant. Is that right? Yes. So that this curve here is precisely the K of W oh, sorry, for this I, setup. I didn't see the W1 and W2. No, my bad. Yep. So yes, this curve is just the callback label divergence for our little setup over here. And so what you see is that there seems to be a little bit more flatness, so to speak, um, around the degenerate node points. Specifically, this point corresponds to a degenerate node. Cool. So from here, our task is we've got our symmetries therefore we understand what the set of true parameters is the generic ones are boring because all parameters will satisfy those generic symmetries which means that if we want to study interesting phases and phase transitions then we want to study these non-generic symmetries where there are particular conditions that make these um, configurations be true parameters or not and so we expect that they'll have different geometry and that's what we're going to study. All righty. So in our experiments here with these toy ReLU networks, we are going to vary the underlying true network and induce a phase transition by doing that. Sampling from the Bayesian posterior is notoriously a very, very, very hard problem for which you typically use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. The problem is this is extremely expensive for any moderately sized network. And by moderate, I mean moderate in like a normal statistics sense, not in a deep learning sense. Like you have no hope of ever being able to use Markov chain Monte Carlo on anything resembling a big modern AI model. It's way, way too expensive. Um, but we can do it in this set up here because we have a sufficiently simple model and uh, it's giving us some useful insights nonetheless. Also measuring the numeric free energy and correspondingly the RLCT is also very hard. Um, Dan and Susan's paper from a few years ago tried to do this called deep learning is singular and that is good. Um, we can post that in the chat later. Um, and there are methods to do it. Watanabe has described methods to computationally estimate the free energy and the RLCT, um, but I could not get it to work in these experiments. Um, it's very, very challenging to do so, particularly because getting your Markov chains to converge properly and produce some meaningful posterior is already hard enough. So instead, since we can't estimate the free energy numerically, we are going to visualize phase transitions in the posterior. So we're going to go by that dogma that phase transitions are a drastic change in the posterior and intuit phase transitions from that. We're going to have an input prior that's just the square. We're going to have a parameter prior that's just a standard normal. And we have 10,000 uh, samples from the true distribution. And in order to isolate the phases that we care about, we can quotient out by those generic symmetries and we can just define a normalized weight that accounts for the scaling symmetry. And we can define, at, oh, sorry, and we can project each node onto the same W plane um, because of the permutation symmetry. And so 
what that means is that our posterior samples will look something like this. So on the left here, we can see that this business down here is saying that both node one and node two are being projected onto the same uh, plane. And we can see here that this is just raw W samples corresponding to that WI. But if we normalize it by the outgoing weight and just find the effective weight of each node, then it brings us into this picture on the right hand side here. And that is what we are going to care about because we've removed the generic symmetries and we can just study the ones that we actually care about. And so in each experiment, in each uh, theta value, we have 20,000 samples from the posterior. And so you can see 40,000 on each of these plots. All righty, so deforming a network to have node degeneracy. We're going to have a two node model network and we're going to have to the previous slide. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Yeah, the picture, what am I looking at exactly? It'll probably make more sense in a few slides, but okay. essentially these are our posterior samples. And so we are going to study this. Uh, Each network is Yes. Each network is a pair of dots, like a pair of an orange and a, oh, I see. Okay. So each yellow dot corresponds to one sample of this and each purple dot corresponds to one sample ah, of this. After yes. After you've normalized out, which is what that W hat there is referring to. Good question. Um, cool. So model network like that, we're going to have a true network defined by two nodes that are going to rotate in toward one another, which looks like this. So we start with a setup where you genuinely need two nodes to define it. Um, well, to define it accurate, accurately, there's only, that is the only configuration that gives a true parameter. But as we rotate it inwards, we end up with this situation where we've still got the two nodes active in the truth, but we don't need to. And so in that sense, there is a node degeneracy there. And so our question is going to be, which of these two phases is preferred by the posterior at theta equals pi on two? Because both of these configurations correspond to true parameters, but what our intuition from the free energy formula tells us is that the one with less complexity, less effective dimensionality, which would just be one node, one arrow, we expect that that will probably be the preferred configuration of the posterior. And so if that is true, then the question also becomes, does this change at some critical angle? Because we're going to start with a case where we genuinely need two nodes. And so if we end up in a case where we only need one node, does that mean that there is some critical theta where that changes? Sorry, I'm you... just lots of confused questions. We, you're, you're sort of, you have these two rel neural networks or parts mm -hmm. and you're, turning them into each other mm -hmm. and there's some sort of rotation. Yep. So what is being rotated exactly? The angle of the truth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So the angle of these nodes here. The angle, right. I think you explained this earlier. What is that angling with or I, what, do, what is, what are these graphs well, telling me? It's precisely that vector, right? So you're just you're just changing the vector by increasing theta. Right. So at theta equals zero, this vector over here, W1, mm. will be equal to one zero. And then it's gonna go up and then uh, eventually. And W two zero is like zero one or something? 
Yeah, negative. Right. Okay, I see. Negative one. Oh, comes up. Aha. Uh -huh. Thanks. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. So yes, these are our two key questions, and so we can depict this on our W plane by looking at the magnitude of the two nodes. And so we can say, well, the non-degenerate phase would suggest that the two nodes have a magnitude, they're gonna start by having a magnitude of one, just like here. And then they're gonna come in together. Whereas the degenerate phase is signified by one arrow having a magnitude of two and the other one, which would correspond to a dot here, and the other one obviously being zero, which would correspond to a dot here. All righty. So we finally arrived back to the original animation that was the centerpiece of this talk. Here is our phase transition. Nice. All right. So, so what is going on? Right. <laughs> so my question, first question is, is this a second order phase transition? This is a first order phase transition. But the two things. Yeah. They but they're like different they're things. Emerging. Okay. Yeah. So the reason this is a first order phase transition can be seen by looking at this bottom curve down here. So first thing to point out is that all the other curves like this in this talk have been free energy curves. This one is a bit different. This is the relative frequency of samples from each of these bands in here. And so what we see, so it's a, a measure of posterior concentration effectively. And what we see is that at this critical value of 1.26, the two have the exact same, the two phases have the same concentration and therefore they swap from which one is preferred by the posterior. So for low theta values, the non-degenerate phase is preferred. And then at that crossing point, it flips over. And now the degenerate phase becomes preferred at the end there. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe it's not two true parameters. The two red dots are one dot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Each, because we're plotting networks are pairs of dots, one dot per hidden node, because each hidden node has two weights associated to it up to normalization. So when he says red dot equals truth, it's the truth. It's the two, the two vectors. So the merging, nothing's merging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, there's no merging. That, um, yes, so the red dots correspond to the two vectors here that are being rotated from that picture before. And so you can see them being rotated into one another, which induces this first order phase transition. But I mean, the truth is somehow more complex than the model. I mean, because the, the truth binds this, is this not a term? So no, so the truth at the end at theta equals pi on two, what we are seeing is that the degenerate phase is being preferred because what's happening is we're obviously seeing a lot more concentration in here, which means that we've got this setup where one arrow, one vector has a magnitude of two and the other one has a magnitude of zero. Can you go back to the definition of the truth in the model? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. Insightful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you when you rotate this at the end, W hat one and W hat two in the truth, both of them are non-zero. Both of them are not. Right. They're right. both non-zero, but there exists. A true network that is equivalent. That's that is exactly equivalent. equivalent, but like, and that's technically the, the, the truth is is this. Technically, uh, yes, technically it is, but you, it's sort of just an artifact yes. because I could also just have defined 
the true network to have just one node yeah, at the theta yeah, of the file. Yeah, yeah, sure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we have these two different configurations. And what we're seeing is that the posterior prefers the one where one node is degenerate, which is to say a simpler model mm -hmm. at the end. The other interesting thing, as I was pointing out before, is that we see a first order phase transition when these two cross over, when one, when the degenerate node phase becomes compared. And what our theory of the free energy formula has told us is that this should correspond to when the accuracy of the degenerate node phase becomes good enough that its complexity trade-off is sufficiently small that, uh, that the true network, sorry, that the model might prefer that phase. And so what we have seen, so this, this curve here is the inaccuracy as we vary the theta value. And so what we're seeing is our first order phase transition is there. And if you take that down, it's approximately in the, in the area where the uh, where the accuracy of the two phases seems to be reasonably similar. And therefore, the simpler model becomes preferred. Is that the true parameters are preferred according to their RLCT? I will note that these models are not analytic. So technically, singular learning theory as it currently stands does not in the general theory that we've been talking about it, but it still gives the general essence and Watanabe has proven a recent result that sort of suggests that you can take the number of parameters to be this kind of pseudo RLCT that gives the same essence of what we're talking about here. So nonetheless, True parameters are preferred according, according to the RLCT and non-true parameters can be preferred at finite n, which obviously we're always in finite n, um, but because of the accuracy complexity trade-off. And so here, the degenerate node becomes preferred even though it is not yet a true parameter, even though it is not yet optimally accurate. And so we see a first order phase transition because the simpler singularity, oh sorry, well, that should be around the other way. The simpler model becomes accurate enough. The simpler phase becomes accurate enough. Don't take that as the simpler singularity. Question. Mm -hmm. So, so, on the bottom one there, these are measuring the relative density of the two phases within. So it's, it's basically taking for each theta value, take the ratio of the points in here to the points in the purple. Oh, sorry, not the ratio, take the um, relative frequency of the points in the yellow compared to the points in the purple. And so it's basically um, like, so this epsilon equals 0.3, that's just a matter of talking about the width of the annulus there or the radius of the annulus, I suppose. Um, and essentially it's just a curve that puts some kind of numeric measure to what we're seeing visually with the posterior. What's happening in the top is the most important bit. So it's basically e to the minus free energy. Yeah. So the probability that you're in yellow is e to the minus free energy of the yellow phase. So mm -hmm. it's just another way of plotting the free energy. Yeah. From memory, I think when I was doing the thesis, plotting it as the free energy just like was not a very good plot to look <laughs> just but, visually right. from memory. Um, no worries. The, this theta, the magic angle, the critical theta, depends on the data set size, right? If I take the data set to infinity, you're only going to see the transition mm. 
exactly where they line up. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So have you looked in that direction, in the number of samples direction? No. No, I did not. So it'd be interesting. To do. To do it. So you would you would expect that <laughs> hey audience. It's audience this weekend we are doing a <laughs> you can do it in one night, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's a good point though. You would expect this point, this critical point, to shift further and further to the right as you increased n. Exactly. Um, yeah, so that, that is what you would expect. Cool. So. But it would start at uh, uh, one point six. Yeah, 1.6. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I'll do is I'll just quickly show you a similar, well, not a similar, but another kind of phase transition associated to the orientation reversing symmetry. So here we're going to have a setup with three nodes in the model and three nodes in the truth. And we're going to have these true nodes be successively rotated by the same, uh, by um, two pi over three. And the variation that we're going to make is that we are going to scale this particular node just by some theta value here. And so what that is doing is it is saying that at ver theta equals one, what even do you get ver theta? I don't even know what that symbol is in normal English, only in LaTeX. Um, anyway, at theta equals one, you have this weight annihilation orientation reversing configuration because these three weights all sum to zero, which means, as I explained before, that you can reverse the weights. But as you increase the gradient of this vector here, you are going to make it not sum to zero anymore because you're going to get this situation where the sum of the weights is just equal to um, negative, uh, actually, I'll do it for down here. Sum of the weights in this particular configuration would be minus one, zero. And so they're not summing to zero, and therefore there is no orientation reversing phase or no orientation, no orientation reversing true parameter at that theta value. And so our question is going to be which phase is preferred at theta equals one? And does this change at some critical parameter? And so here we can represent these two different phases by these different balls, which again will make more sense when you see the animation. Um, yeah, actually, I might. What's, come what's with the specific choice of parameterization for the for the W one the truth parameters? What do you mean? Sorry. Like the, spe the specific choice of parameterization here, you're only changing W two. Yep. Okay. So you could also break this symmetry by rotating one of the angles instead of just scaling it. But as you'll see in the next graph, it makes sense to scale it because it becomes a lot cleaner to look at. Any way in which you change those true parameters that breaks the weight annihilation will mean that it's no longer a true parameter. All righty. So here is our phase transition for this one as I showed you at the start but here the way to interpret this is that this point corresponds to this arrow only two phases. yes only two phases represented by the purple and the yellow two peaks even though the pictures show the same. yes <laughs> which is a little bit confusing to think about but um do we know why the posterior is concentrated more 
still around the, mm. the outward, outward facing? Good question. So, so uh, yeah, I'll come to that in one moment. So these uh, purple dots correspond to the arrows pointing like this. And then, of course, flipping them is the same as rotating by pi, which is to say that this one then corresponds to this one. This one corresponds to this one, and this one corresponds to this one. So why is it that the non-weight annihilation phase is preferred at theta equals one compared to the weight annihilation phase? Sorry, I interrupted. You should finish saying what the transition is before you answer this follow-on question. Good idea. The transition is the fact that this weight annihilation phase in these dots, in these regions of the posterior here, they cease to exist as we increase theta, which is what we predicted. But the point here is that there is a second order phase transition about now at theta equals two, where they have no more posterior concentration. So in this particular posterior, at no point are they the global minima of the free energy, but they are still a local minima of the free energy. And therefore there is a second order, well, in this case, destruction phase transition where that phase no longer has any posterior concentration. Does that make sense? which is what we expect because as we vary theta, it no longer is a true parameter. So it lines up with the theory again. Um, so to go back to Jesse's question, why is it that we're seeing what we're seeing? So I did a few little experiments in my thesis that kind of tried to look at this a little bit. Some sort of intuition for it is that the relative error of what happens when you nudge one of these arrows in here, the relative error of this configuration of that region in particular is greater compared to if you nudge one of these arrows. Because the problem is, as soon as you nudge one of the arrows, take all of those off, as soon as you nudge one of the arrows in here, you uh, it means that there is, it's a, how do I say it? It is a non-zero gradient in that region. And when you carry out the calculation, you just see that it induces a, um, a uh, it just means that the loss, the, the KL divergence on one of those small nudges is just greater mm -hmm. than that over here. So, with my little back of the envelope calculation, my intuition is that maybe they don't have different RLCTs, but maybe they have different lower order terms, but that's just an, a little postulate of mine. And, and what I showed, um, which I don't have a picture of here, but if you increase the size, if you keep those ReLU networks the same, but you increase the size of the input prior, so you in increase the size of that square, then the relative error of that inner region ceases to become very meaningful. And so in that sense, you actually see that these, um, uh, the two phases seem to approach having similar free energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just a... There's the little back of the envelope calculation in my thesis that kind of looks at that and, mm -hmm. and just builds some intuition around it. So, yeah, so we have seen that the non-weight annihilation phase is preferred and it seems to change, or not change, but the, there is a change. There is a second order phase transition at theta equals two. And so, that brings us to the end. And we have seen that true parameters are preferred according to the RLCT. Phase transitions can occur when the accuracy complexity trade-off says so. 
and therefore <laughs> AI is equal to all of my pretty animations because phase transitions are everything. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you very much for listening. And um, yeah, as I was saying at the start, all of these points are addressed in my sequence on less wrong. So feel free to go there and see any of this stuff in more detail. And I will upload these notes without animations. I'll upload them in PDF form as well, if anyone's interested. Cool. Um, lots of thanks from the chat. And there's a question, um, is there a GitHub code? up for studying these things? Yes, I have uploaded my code from my thesis to my GitHub repo, which is um, uh, which is on my website, which I can share it with people. Um, it's like, it's relatively clean-ish. You'd sort of, I, I would say that the code that I have there is more for, inspiration or very small modifications. Um, anything that was doing something a bit more drastic, you'd probably just kind of take the general framework of the code and build upon that. Um, certainly not in like a beautiful package format or something, but um, uh, yeah, it, it is there if if people are interested in Get a quick question. So um, do we see any of the more classical second order phase transitions where they merge? They merge? Is that well maybe more complicated models some somewhere else? Yeah, this is this was the funny thing because as Alex was kind of like hinting at with the degenerate phase transition, as in the degenerate degenerate node phase transition like Dan and I started doing that thinking like oh we're gonna merge these two minima and make them like more singular and then of course like you carry it through and you're like oh no that doesn't make any sense that's not what is happening um I don't I don't have a great idea or intuition off the top of my head as to how you would create a merging of two minima in this particular setup. Do you have any ideas, Dan? Not. Mm. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say actually something I haven't really emphasized in this talk. Um, in my thesis, I, provide a full classification of W0. And that is all of the symmetries that I explained here, um, which is to say that I sort of didn't know this as I was doing it, but by the time it got to the end of the thesis, it turned out that I had really found like, in some sense, the two canonical phase transitions for this setup, because we have all of the phases and you see that the non-generic ones are the degenerate node and the orientation reversing. And so just kind of by happenstance, stumbled upon, <laughs> stumbled upon those two things and then sort of did the classification calculation and was like, oh yeah, that is what happened. Um, and yeah, and that was really derived from th these experiments started in the, um, in Dan and Susan's paper where they were studying these M symmetric networks as I ended up calling them, where the arrows perfectly cancel out. And my first order of business was just like, what does the posterior look like here? And we sort of looked at it and we were like, what the hell? <laughs> so yeah, um, in that sense, maybe there isn't a merging of minima that makes sense, but um, yeah. I can see another question here. Yep. Next what are the question. key challenges in connecting SGD steps to phase transitions? It, it yes. really does. Here's Dan to, to answer. I will just refuse the ground of the question. Hmm. I mean, we don't usually talk about phase transitions in the dynamical time, right? Because when you're talking about phases, you're talking about 
configurations that are stable and how those stable configurations change under some change in conditions. I mean, it's not like time and temperature are comparable things. There's a reason why there was no time in Jesse's talk. That doesn't mean we can't like explain potentially some of the things that happen over time, uh, but like phase transitions with respect to time are not really a thing. So I'll just change the question to, Phase. As we run SGD, we observe things that look like rapid changes in some metric, which look like phase transitions. In what sense are they phase transitions? Uh, that's a question that will be addressed on Friday. Cool. Do you have another question? Yes, Dan. Somewhat related question. <clears throat> Jesse in his talk talked about metastability and fluctuations. Do you think there's an analogous situation here? Because you show these two curves intersecting and Jesse explicitly mentioned that in physics, sometimes you get these cases where at this point, the purple line keeps being favored for some time until snapping to the yellow. Mm. Can we think of something that's analogous here? Or is this a confused question to ask? There's a difference between uh, this we're talking about densities, and there we were talking about the specific state of the system. But still, yeah. if you watch a half of chain, it happens. Yeah. Right. And you could be past that transition, mm -hmm. watching a half of chain. Right. And then, like, come on, come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Way. All right. That's a good example. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So for the people who, don't, who didn't hear, Dan mentioned that Markov chain sometimes have this property. You sort of see on, on the right bottom already, right? The this the phase that gets destroyed is already a local minimum because it has less posterior earlier on. Or is that is that a wrong interpretation? Um no, I think that's reasonable. Um because like in a really basic kind of way, you could think about it as like if if SGD or if your Markov chain is sort of searching the space and it's like some kind of ball searching the lost landscape, like when the two phases, I mean, the top one is probably the best one to look at there, right? Where they are genuinely equal at one point, it's kind of bouncing between two and it isn't really settled on which one is the favourite, which is what the theory sort of predicts do you want to change that interpretation yeah that's right so just to maybe fully clarify it so you'd imagine running a markov chain and while it's running messing with the parameter right so then you'd be moving from left to right on this bottom left plot and it's like the markov chain is running and while it's running you're moving the carpet under its feet and it's Okay, now about now you'd expect it to be like, okay, suddenly moving over to the deeper minimum, but it's maybe, I mean, it, until that minimum completely disappears, it, it may still stay there for a while, not jump together. As a follow-up, would the local minima affect the geometry that is traversed during the SJD process? One would expect so. Mm -hmm. Yep. And how would you, in principle, distinguish between generic symmetries that one would quotient out in the setup versus one that gives an interesting singularity? You would, well, in this case, you distinguish between them by doing the classification <laughs> and seeing that the scaling symmetry and the permutation symmetry hold for all parameters. Maybe you could also... Uh, No, I won't say that. Um, yeah, the, the scaling and the permutation symmetry just genuinely hold for all parameters, whereas there are conditions in the true network that mean that the degenerate node and the orientation reversing symmetry arise under some configurations of the true network and are not there under other configurations of the true network. So that's the way that you would distinguish between the two is, is like 
if you didn't have a classification, I guess it doesn't really make sense to talk about something like that. Um, cool. Any other questions or should we wrap up? Have you considered phase transitions between compressible neural, uh, compressible true networks, for example, suspension, suspensions? <laughs> what is the, this is that. <laughs> <laughs> for example um one uh, true um one thing uh sorry truth at theta equals zero has one degenerate node but truth at theta equals one has two degenerate nodes out of like three nodes yeah so really um that would just basically have the same picture and you would just see um, a bigger concentration around the origin. So like if there was, um, if your model had three nodes and it only required two, then, oh, sorry, if it only required one, then if you tried to merge two of those nodes together, you would bring it to the, you would induce that degenerate phase in there and so it sort of doesn't matter how many it is if it's sufficiently merged where they become more degenerate if the truth is more compressible you'll just see a bigger concentration around the degenerate phase um, and you'll just see however many uh sort of gaussian circles around everywhere else that correspond to how many nodes the truth needs at that particular point. Thanks for the great talk and session. Cool. I reckon we can leave it there. Thanks, Liam. Thank you very much.